Good evening, everyone. So, I have a bit of a cold, so my mind is a bit foggy and I sound like this, but I'm going to try my best um, tonight. So, thank you for coming. Um, I am going to... Can everyone hear me okay? Yeah? Okay. Um, I'm going to start with a story from 2009. I don't know if anyone remembers um, the COP15. Um, it's the one that happened... Um, in Copenhagen. Um, so in 2009, the UN Climate Change Conference um, came together in Copenhagen, so that's what we now remember as the COP15, um, and it was a momentous um, occasion. In some ways, all of the COPs um, are always sort of framed as momentous um, occasions, but some of them come at specific um, points in relation to previous treaties, previous protocols, um, etc. So the COP15, the stakes were really, really high. And one of the things, well, one of the main things really that happened um, at the COP15 was um, like a huge amount of conflict. And to some extent, that always happens at COP, right? Because people's interests um, very, very rarely match up, right? Um, and so various delegates um, offered speeches and uh, made pleas. Um, and then a group of countries, um, fairly powerful countries, not just countries from the global north, um, but countries that had um, in common a strong reliance on, on coal. Um, so that was um, the US, China, India, Brazil, and South Africa, that were nicknamed the Dirty Five, um, came together and basically drafted um, an accord. So instead of having a sort of like democratic process, which is what's supposed to happen in COP, there were behind the scenes uh, discussions and these big actors, because together they can really commend um, like a whole bunch of other states, um, came, came together with, um, with an accord that, uh, that stipulated that um, they said, we agree that deep cuts in global emissions are required according to science and as documented by the IPCC fourth assessment report with a view to reduce global emissions so as to hold the increase in global temperature below 2 degrees Celsius and take action to meet this objective consistent with science and on the base of equity. So that's the speech that came out of COP following this proposal um, by, by the Dirty Five. And of course, there's a reason why we call them the Dirty Five and their reliance on coal uh, meant that actually they influenced severely because you know those are powerful countries, they influenced um, the UN body from the inside that then led to this, this particular speech being made. Um, in response to that speech, and of course, like, you know, UN speeches, you really need to be able to, like, read between the lines. But what were they saying there in particular was really this focus on, on a two-degree increase, right? Two, two-degree um, temperature increase, um, which led Lumumba Diaping, who was the Sudanese chair of the G77 group, so that's basically a majority of, like, global south countries, um, he, he said this in, in a speech. He, he, did, he said that the accord that had been reached uh, was the equivalent of asking Africa to sign a suicide pact, an incineration pact in order to maintain the economic dependence of a few countries. So that was 2009. In many ways, very little has changed. I don't know if anyone remembers um, this... Um, the, the specific thing that happened when a delegate from the Philippines... Um, was making a speech and broke into tears, right? Because uh, a typhoon had just been wreaking havoc in, in the Philippines. And to some extent, things like that have kept um, happening over the last few years, right? So we have scenes like that where you have people going to the UN and, and really breaking down because the stakes are incredibly high um, in, in, in some parts um, of the world already and have been for a very long time. So that's. I just wanted to start with this story and I'm going to try and give you some... Um, tools maybe, or like other stories to make sense of, of that moment, right? And, and, and the aim is for us to really try and think about the relationship between um, the climate crisis, which is very high on our headlines right now, um, and, and other issues, including migrant justice and racial justice. So, and I'm going to start with um, uh, an academic, uh, Gargi Bhattacharya, who she's really incredible. I definitely recommend um, having a look at her books. Her most recent one is called Racial Capitalism. And in there, she talks about um, what she calls the myth of expandability, 
And there's this quote in the book that I find really um, useful as a, as a tool to, to make sense of some of the issues we're seeing now in, in the climate movement. She says, the myth of expandability, of expandable people and expandable regions, haunts our time and is a key motor in the forms of capitalist development that operate on the assumption that some populations will never be included and will never reach viability or sustainability. I think this quote is really useful, and even the words that she uses, this idea of some people being expandable or being disposable, which is another word um, that many of us use, I think is really um, useful to think about some of that um, relationship. So in some ways, just like settler colonialism required disposable people, disposable land, um, we see the exact same mechanism um, in, in climate chaos today. Climate chaos requires disposable people. And we'll talk about that a little bit more when we look at some of the solutions that are being offered that I would argue are also relying on similar logics of expandability. Um, and Naomi Klein is another um, academic and activist who does a lot of work um, around climate and has done so for many years. And she works very closely with primarily a lot of um, indigenous groups in, in North America. So a lot of her knowledge very much comes from those frontline communities. And she uses a slightly different um, framing, but is also quite similar to Gargi's, where she talks about sacrificial people and sacrificial um, places. And she has this quote where she talks about um, like what is required, right? She's talking about like these um, industries and the kind of like scales of some of these developments. And she says the only reason we can have that is if we have theories that justify that, right? You can't just get away with um, some of the things we're seeing today if there isn't someone somewhere or a body of um, literature that justifies that. Um, and she uses the example of um, fossil fuels and she says there can be no plausible deniability that all of this um, is only possible because of institutionalized racism, orientalism and potent tools on offer that allow the powerful to discount the lives of the powerless, writing off the lives of entire peoples and nations. These tools that rank the relative value of humans allow for the digging out of fossil fuel. Fossil fuel is so inherently dirty and toxic that they require sacrificial people and sacrificial places, peoples whose lungs and bodies could be sacrificed to work in the coal mines, people whose land and water could be sacrificed to open pit mining and oil spills. I think this quote is really, really powerful, and in many ways you could change some of the words in there to fit different contexts. Outside of, um, outside of North America. Um, and in one of her um, recent books, she has this, this other quote where she says, to sacrifice an entire region, to blow up their mountains, there must be theories of othering to justify it. And about how the people who lived there were so poor and so backwards that their lives and their culture didn't deserve protecting. Um, so I think these, these quotes are really, um, I think they're really useful because they put it quite clearly, this, this idea of like the justification that's needed for, for these industries um, to exist and for states to behave um, the way that they did at um, the COP15. So now, just to bring it into um, the context that we're in right now, right? let's talk about um, Britain. So who are the sacrificial people and the disposable people, the sac sacrificial and disposable places um, in, in Britain? Right? So one example um, that comes to mind is um, a campaign that started quite recently, which is called Clean Air for South Hall um, and Hayes. Has anyone heard of it? Yeah? That's great. So South Hall is in um, West London. It has, I think it's like the largest, it has the largest Sikh community outside of India. Um, and what's happening there is that there is a, a huge development that's underway uh, that was um, supported by Boris Johnson when he was mayor of London, um, whereby the Berkeley Group are going to have started to redevelop um, a former brown uh, Brownfield site, um, on really like incredibly contamin contaminated um, soil. And that's been a known fact for a really, really long time. And as soon as they started to work on that soil and dig some out, um, <coughs> loads of people have been complaining about um, of asthma, headaches, bleeding, um, even like there's issues around like memory loss and like children not being able to focus properly in school. Um, 
loads of loads of things like that, nosebleeds, um, fainting smell, spells, and an increase in cancer diagnoses, right? Um, that's, not, um, that's not something that's happening in Flint, Michigan, that I think maybe a lot of people might have heard about, uh, where so people in Flint, Michigan, majority black population in the US, still don't have clean water, right? Um, but I think what we're, what we're seeing in South Hall is a very similar um, phenomena where developers can get away with, um, with these kinds of practices and where you have children growing up with um, asthma. And similarly, if you think about some of the dirtiest um, industries in, in Britain or the dirtiest roads, um, it's important to think about where those are located, right? So similarly, you have um, the, South, the London South Circular, which is one of the busiest roads in, in London and in the UK, uh, which passes disproportionately, disproportionately through poor, which in this country also means um, the neighborhoods of people of color, right? Because it's impossible to talk about class if you're not also thinking about the relationship with, um, with race. Um, and I think some of you might have heard a few weeks ago from the mother of Ella Casey Sebra, Debra, who, um, who died a few years ago after a really, really severe um, asthma attack, right? And her mom has been a campaigner ever since to really make those connections between air pollution um, and, and led very much by, by the city of London and the mayor of London um, and the way that that intersects with um, both class and, and race in, in her local community. So I think those links are clear, right? Where, where is it that you can put the busiest and the dirtiest roads? Where is it that you can develop sites on contam contaminated um, soil and have children just suffering from like recurring like asthma crises and, and nosebleeds, right? Um, but of course the sacrificial people and the sacrificial places are also outside of Britain, right? Um, because of some of the colonial links, neo-colonial links, uh, Britain's operation affect, um, affect people way beyond national borders. Um, so there's loads of ways of, of looking at that. So for example, you have British companies um, essentially wreaking havoc across, across the globe, right? So in Zambia, for example, uh, Vedanta, which is a mining company, it's, uh, you know how like international uh, corporations sort of like sieges in like different countries, but it's primarily a British company that's also based in India. Um, they, there was a huge incident in one of their mining sites in, in Zambia and they contaminated loads of um, rivers and loads of people died. Um, and for the first time, the people who, who suffered those effects were able to go to court and they managed to win their fight to be able to sue Vedanta in British tribunals as opposed to Zambian um, courts. So that's a momentous um, thing that might be happening in the coming months or, or years because otherwise companies that have their headquarters in, in Britain that are protected by British laws um, are able to just get away with huge amounts of, of devastation, right? So if you think about the, the effects of like BP or companies like um, BHP Billingdon. Um, you remember all the, um, the oil spill that happened in Brazil. We know these images, right? We're familiar with, with those stories, and I think it's important to like, bring Britain back into, into those stories and really have an, a focus on responsibility and what's allowed to happen. So again, that framing of like who's disposable, whose lands are up for grabs, and whose resources are up for taking. Um, I think is useful in making sense of some of those stories that, um, that we might be familiar with. Um, so, what is the relationship between climate justice and racial justice or migrant justice? Um, I'm going to start with um, a video that uh, we made as part of Black Lives Matter UK um, three years ago, um, just a little bit over three years ago. Um, and I'm going to show it to you now. And in that video, I think one of the things that we're trying to do, and I think we're do it, we do it quite successfully, um, is to actually answer that question of like, what is, what is that relationship? The UK is the biggest per capita contributor to global temperature change and the least vulnerable. According to the UNHCR, by 2050, there will be 200 million climate refugees. 7 out of 10 of the countries most affected by climate change 
are in sub-Saharan Africa. Climate crisis is a racist crisis. The average salary of a London City Airport passenger is £92,000 a year. In Newham, where London City Airport is located, 40% of the population is scraped by on 20k or less. Airport power plants and the busiest of roads in the West tend to be in the most disadvantaged working class areas where a disproportionate number of black and brown communities live. Environmental racism means that black people in Britain are 28% more likely to be exposed to air pollution than their white counterparts. Climate crisis is a racist crisis. The London City Airport expansion cannot go ahead because it would further decrease the quality of life for poor black people in this country. It cannot be left unchallenged. At the same time, this year alone, more than 3,120 non-migrants have died trying to reach safety on European shores, fleeing conditions that they did not create. If they can't fly, then the rich won't either. Climate crisis is a racist crisis. Shut it down. So what we did in that video was we made three main points. Um, so the first one was really look at it from, uh, from a local perspective, right? Like looking at what's happening in Newham, which is um, one of the poorest boroughs in London. Looking at London City Airport and the, um, the average salaries of people who use that airport, right? So really starting locally and who is affected by these, um, by these airports. There's a, there's a campaign in um, just around Heathrow as well to fight the, um, I think it's a fourth runway that they're building now. Um, and similarly, it's driven by people who live um, around the airport who are complaining about what, what it means um, for them. So really starting from like that local perspective. Then moving on to the global perspective, looking at Britain's responsibility, both historically um, in terms of like its emissions historically, but also today in terms of the power that, um, that it holds. So just being able to like put Britain into that global picture. Um, and then the third point was really bringing in this, because that was in the midst of what was called then the migrant crisis, um, was also making those links with, uh, with migration, right? Thinking about freedom of movement, who has a right to move um, and who doesn't. So that's what we tried to do in, in that video. Um, the, the backlash that we got off the back of that action was immense. I think, I mean, we didn't expect it to go well, um, but we didn't expect it to go so badly um, in the sense that loads and loads of people were really opposed to not just the action, like, okay, people don't like their airports being blocked, um, but really fundamentally, ideologically opposed to the claims that we were making, right? Because what we were talking about was this like historic responsibility. We were talking about Britain. Um, we were talking about reparations. We were making those like deeply political um, connections, and it didn't go down well. Um, even the sort of like more left-leaning papers that you'd expect would be more sympathetic, really weren't. And they got um, people to go on television, speak on our behalf, um, who just really went and like criticized the action, saying, you know, BLM UK are out of their mind. They're now just calling everything racist, and how can you say that climate change is racist? Blah blah. So really, like also just like mocking, mocking our claims. Um, so it was quite nice to see this week that um, other people managed to block London City Airport and to some extent got a better um, reception. And we can, we can talk about that later, but I think it's important to think about those different moments in time and the kind of receptions to, uh, that we get to like similar um, claims. So now I'm just going to spend a little bit of time telling you about some of the biggest obstacles um, right now. Um, so the first thing is that when you're trying to build these connections about um, the climate crisis and stories of imperialism, talking about race, um, very often you get really, really shut down, right? Um, and I came across this tweet that just came out like a few, a few weeks ago, someone trying to make these like political claims where she says, and she's um, from, from, from a Pacific um, island, I think she might be from Hawaii, um, and she's, she's making connections to the U.S. military um, and really pointing the, at the fact that it's a lot easier to get campaigns and mobilization going about really specific things and often individual acts, um, including a lot of the campaigns around plastic straws um, or even talking about like food consumption and veganism um, than it is to actually talk about military occupation, to talk about the role 
um, of, of the army, because actually the US army is the largest, uh, is the largest emitter of um, carbon in, in the world, right? So actually at asking those questions, why is it that we can't go as far as to actually focus um, on, on this, right? Um, so another uh, big challenge to being able to make those claims um, about the relationship between the climate crisis and racial justice um, actually sadly comes from the climate movement itself. Um, who has heard about the Wretched of the Earth Collective? Great. Who knew about the Wretched of the Earth before the letter to Extinction Rebellion? Okay. Um, so we actually, we started in 2015. Um, and we, if, if you've ever been to like the, the, the annual march, the um, climate change march that takes, part, that takes place in London every year, it's the biggest march, although maybe now it's not, because there's been some like big mobilization. Um, but in 2015, um, so the way that it works every year is that there's a lot of like behind the scenes conversations to decide who's going to be at the front. So one year it's going to be young people because young people are the future, blah, blah, blah. One year um, it might be women because of the way in which um, climate chaos operates and like affects disproportionately people who are already marginalized, including um, like gender inequalities. So women are going to be marching first. That year, um, the people had to like push really hard behind the scenes and it was agreed that the march would be led by um, uh, a, a block of frontline communities, right? So black and brown and indigenous um, communities were going to lead the march. So we came together, uh, a group, like an, a number of us, of um, a lot of dias diaspora groups, solidarity groups, um, and also the people who travel to be able to come to the COP, including a lot of indigenous um, people and, and um, human rights defenders who will travel to the COP and speak in the official um, sessions. So we came together, we renamed the block, instead of calling it Global Frontlines, which is a bit vague, we called ourselves the rest of the earth, um, after a famous book by Franz Fanon. And so technically, we're officially going to be leading the march. On the day we arrived and we had um, placards like this one that said British imperialism causes climate injustice. Um, our big banner, which you're probably going to see in one of the next slides, said um, stop, what? stop um, CO2 colonialism, your, your climate profits kill. Um, because at the time in 2015, one of the biggest agendas was um, talking about green capitalism and trying to think about um, like carbon offsetting and like all that stuff. So you buy a bit of forest somewhere and suddenly it's okay for you to pollute load somewhere else. So we're actually really pointing the finger at these practices um, of, of profiting from, from the climate crisis. What happened is that the organizers of the march hated our placards. They hated the fact that um, what they, maybe they expected us to just show up in like pretty costumes and dance at the front and make it look, you know, nice and pretty and brown. Uh, but actually we came with, uh, with political messaging. So they put tall animals on stilts. So if you imagine the cast of um, the Lion King, you know, the really tall ones, tall giraffes, very beautiful, but that meant that no one could see our banners, no one could see our sign. They really hated this sign. They really wanted to take it down. They tried to grab it. Um, so then we did a sit-in because we said, we're not going to march until we can be seen. Um, and then they got people to overtake us. And then we folded the banner. We ran to the front and we tried to march at the front. Then they called the police on us. Um, so it was a mess. That day was a really, really, really horrible, horrible day. Um, because we thought that the climate movement was ready and willing to welcome us at, at the front, as had been previously agreed. And then there was a stark realization that actually they weren't ready to have these um, conversations. And that it, it bothered them. Um, so following that, we, we formalized um, as, as a group, and we've been active ever since as, as the Wretched of the Earth. Um, so that's just to tell you a little bit about the context in, in the climate movement. And to some extent, I think some things have changed, um, but, and maybe we can talk about the extent to which this, this change has happened um, a little bit later on. Oh, that was the banner um, that was made, and then we changed our slogan on, on the day, given everything that was happening, um, saying we die first, we fight first, we march first. Um, 
to bring it to some of the things that are happening today, um, I think it's really important to, one, acknowledge the, the mass mobilization that's been happening in the last year and a bit um, in, in countries like the UK. So, of course, you have um, the youth strikers who've been at the forefront um, of a lot of this conversation. Um, and then a little bit more recently, Extinction Rebellion, grabbing headlines. Um, and I think there's something really positive to a lot of people joining, joining the movement and, and getting involved and really trying to like, fight for climate justice. Um, but I think there, is some, there are some issues in some of the framing that we're um, seeing. And one of the things I really want to talk about is the, the notion of green nationalism, what some might also call um, eco-fascism. So here I've got some of the starkest um, examples of like the, the worst kind of like eco-fascism. And I don't know if you've come across any of those stickers. I think these might not be from the UK, but there are similar narratives um, coming through in the UK. So on this sticker here, it says, plant more trees, save the seas, deport refugees. Um, and then the big one over there says, save bees, not refugees. Um, and the point here is that it's actually very easy to use the climate crisis as a catalyst for furthering um, far-right agenda. So I think that's really clear from here. But I think, and personally, I think that that's some of the work we need to be doing always, is when we're thinking about the far-right, is, is see the way in which those narratives actually permeate what we call the mainstream, right? Because, yeah, okay, these are just some stickers, and they're, like, really extreme, and it's the far-right, and they're just, you know, doing their thing over there. But actually, we need to be able, when we're thinking about the far-right, we need to see the way in which... It's constantly in conversation with the mainstream and it's constantly pushing the mainstream towards the right, right? So one of the things that um, you might hear if you go to some rallies, some events, is um, a narrative that says um, that's actually anti-mass migration, right? Um, and it's happened, I know there was like a big mobilization in London Fields not too long ago by um, like a specific local branch of Extinction Rebellion um, that was actually saying, that was warning against the dangers of mass migration, saying actually what we need to be doing is we can have a conversation that is about like opening borders. We need to close our borders because if, um, if we allow mass migration, then Britain is going to be even less sustainable than it is now. And if we're less sustainable, then that's bad for everyone else. So we need to make sure we need to keep people out in order to be able to move forward as a country. And maybe we can help them stay over there, right? That's when you see some of these conversations permeating into the mainstream and even in what we might think as like being quite radical um, solutions. Um, and then more generally, if you think about some of the demands that are being put forward and some of the conversations that are happening now in light of all of the mobilization, you'll see that they're very much permeated by nationalist um, thinking, right? So the idea is let's just cut um, emissions, let's declare a climate emergency, let's shift the way we consume and the way we create um, power. Um, and then the question that many of us are asking is, so what is the vision, right? Does the struggle end when Britain reaches sustainability, right? Is the green economy for Britain the vision, right? What about everything that's happening beyond, beyond British borders, right? And thinking back to this notion of sacrificial people, sacrificial places, thinking back to Britain's both like historical responsibility, but also its responsibility today. I think many of us are trying to push the narrative and talk about reparations and talk about um, equity, right? And the, uh, there's the, if you want to look into that, you can, there's um, a framing called fair share. Britain needs to do its fair share. And that means looking at the way in which Britain is currently actively preventing other people from developing sustainable solutions through unfair trade deals, through debt um, and, and a whole bunch of other um, mechanisms that mean that actually, yeah, we might achieve some decent level of sustainability, we might build more wind power, um, but actually if it's not, uh, if there isn't like a global, a focus on like a global um, solution, it won't really make, make a dent. Um, so I think that's why a lot of people have been pushing for not just a national Green New Deal, but a, gro a global Green New Deal, which means thinking about like, the financial um, structures of resourcing everyone to, be able, to being able to um, lift um, themselves up. Um, I think there was one last thing I wanted to say, but maybe I forgot. Um, 
Anyway, so moving forward, I think there's been um, a lot of really positive things and a lot of different people coming together to try and um, really flesh out this idea of what, what even is climate justice. Because to some extent, a few years ago, we weren't even talking about climate justice. Right? This is a, it's part of like the new vocabulary, and at the, the core of the idea of climate justice is really this idea of like interconnection. Um, so one of the things that um, we've done as far as the rest of the earth was to write um, an open letter to Extinction Rebellion um, in May um, this year. It was really, really successful. It got translated into several languages. It really did the rounds. Um, and we got loads of positive, um, loads of positive feedback. Um, we also got loads of negative stuff. The negative stuff usually is along the lines of you're just taking away from the struggle. You're diluting this key message we worked really hard to develop. Um, so essentially saying questions of race and questions of colonialism are um, sort of like side stories to the main story of, of climate chaos. So some of the conflict is actually quite deeply ideological about like what exactly is, is the vision. Do we have a shared vision or do we not? Um, but there was definitely like a lot of good stuff that came from that. Um, and so one of our, so at the end of that, we had some recommendations, and this is one of them, which I've already alluded to. So pushing for a global Green New Deal. So really taking um, nationalism out of our vision for climate justice. Um, you can find it online, and you can read, um, you can read the whole thing. Um, and so I guess like this is really some of what um, what excites me at the moment is different people really trying to shift things um, inside of their different spaces to build, um, to really build this vision in a way that's more collective. And there's a lot of conversations that are happening. Um, and so I think this is quite, quite a key moment to be thinking about and acting on some of these things um, that I've talked about today and really building um, these, these connections. Um, in terms of still moving forward, I think um, so there's been lots of work that's been done for, for years, and lots of people have offered um, different kinds of um, solutions. But I think this, um, so the one on the right, really talking about storytelling. Um, so Joshua Verisami, who's also a member of um, the Russia of the Earth Collective, um, wrote this piece for Consent in Magazine a few years ago, where he talks about the role of storytelling. And I think that's why maybe I'm bringing it here, um, with a lot of you who are involved in, in different parts of like the arts, is thinking about what does it mean to interrupt um, <coughs> storytelling. Um, and I think there is a huge role in, in really interrupting those, um, those stories we have about who are the victims of climate chaos, what do they look like, but also who are the people who are fighting and who really are at the front line of resisting um, the climate crisis, right? And I think that is a question of that is really linked to narrative and is really linked to storytelling. So we need to be able to tell different stories about what exactly is this climate crisis, right? Like, what does it look like and who does it, um, who does it involve? Um, so, yeah, I might just leave you with that and we can flesh this out um, a little bit more. If you want to find out more, um, you can follow either the BLM UK um, accounts or the rest of the earth and also I'm not totally sure how that's going to work but I brought um, a few copies of this uh, magazine by Consented who do lots of amazing work um, with young people um, and they, they donated a bunch of magazines to us um, I wrote something in there that basically is a more straightforward summary of what I've just been telling you and loads of people have written this uh, so the content is really really good I don't know how it's going to work. Maybe you can explain. So yeah, if you want one, um, yeah, you can have one. Thank you. Um, all right. Uh, I, I've, I've got a, a couple of questions. They're normally kind of recaps of the talk, but it was super clear. So I don't feel the need to do that quite so much. You mentioned a few times that things have changed since 2015. Um, and I was wondering uh, what, what had changed and what experience what the difference was now, and also why. Uh, I think it might be worth also saying a bit more about what the action at London City was. I think people probably picked up that it was an obstruction of the airport, which also happened a couple of weeks ago, is that right? Um, but at that time, you're obviously kind of getting a lot of hostility, both from the cops and the authorities, as you'd expect, but also 
what seemed uh, really important for the issues you were raising outside of those obvious forces of trying to stop you was the limitations from within the movement, within the climate chaos, climate chaos movement. Um, and I was wondering what, why, if you could say a bit more about why you thought they were objecting at that point, and also what what the current state of because my general sense it was welcomed the the most recent um, obstruction to London City within the movement anyway, um, and uh, I think you mentioned it in relationship to the march as well that you thought it'd be a very different situation now than it was in 2015. Um, but to, what, why why have things moved on in sort of more favourable ways? Yeah. Um, so about the London City Airport action, so there was a lot of resistance and I think um, I think a lot of similar to the march people weren't willing or weren't welcoming of us trying to shift because well in some ways the action was challenging some of the narratives of um, that have come from the climate movement right by insisting by not making race the third point in in the messaging by making race central to actually all three points um, I think that was quite uh, a challenge um, at the same time the action was developed um, and was supported by part of, of the climate movement, right? Um, but I think it's really that idea of like how far how far are you allowed to go when you're challenging narratives. So actually the city airport action was the second big um, action that we did as a group. The first one was just, um, just about a month earlier where groups in London, Nottingham, Birmingham and I think Manchester blocked um, either major roads or trains, or I think the tram in Nottingham. Um, and, and the aim was really to call, uh, to really point to all of the, the other forms of like structural violence, so looking at um, police and state violence, so looking at um, police brutality, but also the effects of like cuts and austerity um, on black populations, looking at things like school exclusion, um, unemployment, um, and also looking at um, immigration. And that first action wasn't really welcomed, obviously, um, but there was significantly less pushback. Um, I mean, again, people don't like having their roads blocked, people don't like having their trains stopped, um, but we still were able to like, get some, some degree of like, sympathetic um, frame. I think the, the main objection was like, oh, there isn't really like, a deep issue of like, racism and, and police brutality in the UK that really happens in the US. I think that's usually the biggest obstacle that we face as a group um, but with the London City Airport it really was like it, it was just like a it was a crazy claim really like everything like all of the framing was about like us just getting it totally wrong and it was it was the claim became unacceptable um, from from lower people in like in the movement including the anti-racist movement um, that just wasn't keen to have the issue of racism in Britain being diluted by now moving to talking about climate justice. Mm. You're getting it from both sides. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, um, and actually the main sources of support that we got were from um, people in, in the Global South. So I remember getting um, like private messages from campaigners in Kenya who were just saying like, finally, like finally people in the UK are starting to wake up and making, making these connections. Um, so it was really interesting and really important, I think, for us to also be able to like see um, see these effects and really making those connections between our national and nationalized sort of experiences in Britain and but also thinking more globally about the effects that Britain has outside of its national borders. Um, now in terms of things having changed, I, I maybe I should, just shouldn't have said that in my lecture because I don't know if I really think that. Um, to some extent I do, like I don't think that the kind of like physical violence that happened at the front of the march would happen again, but in some ways I think it happens all the time, like every time that there is um, a, a meeting or there people come together around tables of power, uh, more or less close to the climate movement, and none of us are at the table, or the solutions that come from there don't speak to our lived realities and the lived realities of the communities that we come from. Um, I think that it's the same. It's the same kind of violence, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. um, I think when people come together to design um, proposals for um, the conversation for the Green New Deal in Britain and all of the solutions are really nationalistic in their thinking and in their framing. 
I think it's the same kind of violence. Um, and I could go on. I think there's actually still a lot of examples where, where you can see that erasure. That's not just a question of like representation. It's not just about having more black people on the table or brown people on the table. But I think it's really about like, what is your vision for climate justice? Does your vision for climate justice acknowledge um, the experiences of, of communities that aren't represented at that table? Um, and I think that's, I wouldn't, I definitely wouldn't claim that that's fundamentally changed and that something like that wouldn't be possible mm. today because I think it, it's happening um, all the time. All right, I'm going to ask you one more question in two parts. Um, I mean, it seems, it seems pretty, I mean, it's kind of pretty basic social analysis that inequality is differently distributed mm -hmm. and some people are more victims of inequality than others and you can have kind of sociological categories around that. So you're saying you can't, you can't explicate race and class in the UK or the United States or anywhere across Northern Europe, um, if, if, if the world. Um, so it seems kind of pretty obvious that uh, if you're dealing with climate justice, you're going to, the specific, it, it pans out differently in different places. And so there's a kind of sociology to what the uh, climate violence, or climate, how, how climate chaos, who it visits and suffer upon. So you know, the example in Stanford, you mentioned Flint and so on and so forth. I mean, that, that seems like a really basic and obvious point, that there's a sociology to this and it's different, differentially distributed. What's the resistance to understanding that within the, the mainstream climate movement that you're struggling with? So that's, that's a kind of, uh, why, why is there a wish to not acknowledge you know, the, the kind of class and race differentiation uh, which impacts different people differently? And I guess the other side which um, I just thought about when you answered the previous point, my understanding is that Black Lives Matter started in the US as a response to police brutality and police violence, police killings against uh, young black people mainly, or just black people, um, who are kind of disproportionately uh, targets of aggression. Um, but this is a very different type of politics to that in some ways. It's obviously there's structural racism in both cases. Mm -hmm. But I was wondering if there'd been any, um, uh, yeah, just what's going on within Black Lives Matter internationally um, in shifting the focus from the kind of uh, targeting, police targeting, to this kind of much more distributed and sort of, it's, it's, a, it's a much less specific problem in some ways. Right? It's not like you can say the cops are bad. Mm. It's like there's a big problem that everyone's involved in. Um, and so whether there's a kind of discussion within Black Lives Matter mm. uh, and the different kind of aspects of it. No one said they weren't bad. Um, so the first question about like why is there so much resistance to a claim that's pretty simple, really. Um, I think, I mean, I... What immediately came to mind when you were saying that was just thinking back of like a few years ago when I was really cutting my teeth into activism and sitting in like organizing meetings or whatever and hearing something and wanting to respond and say, like add something to what was being said. Um, so starting in like just traditional like left groups um, and just thinking like, oh, I guess they're not really talking about like this specific thing that I know happens, right? When you're poor but you're also black. Um, and I think it's that, because often if you do, at least when I used to, uh, you can get like quite immense amount of backlash, right? Because these are, they're not just disagreements about like strategy and tactics, but some of that is like a, there's ideological disagreements. Similarly, in, um, there is conflict within feminism, for example, about like what, like what is a feminist um, vision and very often if you come from more marginalized um, communities or you're trying to like bring that into the canon right it's not just saying we can add that as like the final the tenth point but actually how do we reshape it so that it fundamentally addresses it um, like throughout um, I think you can face quite a lot of like violence and you see it all the time especially on social media you see people facing immense amount of backlash for just asking for these shifts to happen so a lot of the campaigns to um, decolonize the curriculum, for example, face huge amounts of backlash because what they're asking is for actually quite a fundamental shift in the way of thinking. Um, so you might have, yeah, people being quite fundamentally ideologi ideologically opposed to that. And to some extent, I think that's some of the conflict that we see with some groups now who are 
like ideologically opposed to stretching the idea of climate justice to include things like migrant justice or racial justice, when actually what we're saying is that if you achieve climate justice the way that we envision it, automatically you would have had to achieve migrant justice and racial justice because you can't have, you can't have climate justice with like militarized borders, right? Like that wouldn't be climate justice. It'd be something else. It might be a green, sustainable Britain, sure, but that's not climate justice. So in some ways it's an ideological conflict that's not just about strategies, but it really is about this vision. So that's, I guess that's how you can explain the, the conflict that then might come from different groups. People saying like, no, you're taking away from like our class analysis. No, you're taking away from like our tight, sexy messaging about climate chaos. Um, so I think that's for your first question. Um, the second question that was about um, some of the work that's happening in like Black Lives Matter in the US, um, I think it's really interesting and I think in some ways it's also linked to this, um, this idea of storytelling. That the way that um, we in the UK but also I think maybe globally, the idea that um, Black Lives Matter is primarily focused on police brutality um, I think in some ways the way of pigeonholing what black liberatory, liberatory activism or anti-racist organizing looks like. Because actually from the very beginning, they were constantly making those connections. So the, the fact that loads of people were nodding when I was talking about what's happening in Flint, Michigan, um, that came from Black Lives Matter organizing, right? They were there mm. and they organized it and, it was, and then it became like a national focus and actually so there's a, there's a bunch of um, BLM groups in, in the US and there's also like one sort of like parent group um, that's always been part of it. And so they're doing loads of work on like, um, like prison abolition. They're doing loads of work still in, in Flint and also after Hurricane Katrina, those links about like environmental racism and what happens after devastation, those links have always been there. Um, so I think it's more a question of like, what is allowed to travel and what's the narrative that we have of specific movements and what does, yeah, what does like black politics look like and how does it get translated into something that's really specific. Mm -hmm. um, and in some ways, I guess what I take from that is the role for like political education. So again, it's this idea of like we need to be better at vision building, right, imagining what liberation looks like, what freedom looks like, um, and that's only possible if you keep pushing the narrative. So even the London City Airport action, to me, whether or not we, can, we think that it was a success or not, whether or not the backlash happened and the extent of the backlash you know, was, was hard to deal with, I think that was us trying to push that narrative to build these connections where people maybe didn't see them before. Okay. Um, questions? Let's see, there's one. There's, okay. There's, okay. I'll take. There's one over here, and then one at the back, and one over here. Hi there. Um, so thanks for coming today. Um, so I'm just so confused because, like, 20 years ago, I took a class on like environmental racism in grade school. So I'm like surprised that that's like an issue that people don't believe. Um, like, I didn't even know that was in question. Mm. Um, and definitely, like, I don't know, maybe not in the US, I don't know. But I guess my question is, since environmental, <coughs> like, climate, racism, unlike like, other social issues, could actually be solved by technology, is there, has anyone ever considered getting behind technologies that could solve certain issues, like coming up with solutions as opposed to, like, ideological arguments? And, like, would that be more effective? All right, that's a good start. Um, <laughs> take, take these two, and then, and then a few response to these because the next question's over. Um, thanks so much for your talk, and I'm really, really glad that we were able to hear this because I think it's just super important, uh, and, and yeah, it was an absolutely brilliant talk. Um, I just wanted to ask, um, again, being like, uh, about the climate movement, to what extent um, do you think it's harmful for groups to frame things like climate crisis around like conceptions like extinction and conceptions like uh, chaos um, in a way that seems often removed from the consequences that these, these things have on the lives of people that are incredibly marginalized. So it seems to me like extinction is often this thing that talks with like a break um, or like the end of humanity 
Whereas what I feel is the real kind of damage that's likely to be caused by a climate crisis is, you know, the, the, the duration leading up to it, uh, where, you know, um, the state is likely to step in and protect the interests of the people who it has traditionally always protected, whereas it won't. Uh, for those who are already marginalized, and for me, this is why like climate is such a race issue. So I wanted to ask, like, to what extent do you think that kind of side of the messaging needs to be changed around climate activism? All right. Can I see if there's any more questions on this side? Just, just have what's going to run over there in a minute. No. No. Okay. Do you want to take those two? Yeah. <clears throat> um, both are really good questions. Um, the question about the like the role of technology, I think it's a really, um, it's a really good question. I think it's a really important one. Um, I think my simple answer to that is that if you don't address the, the mechanisms and some of the stuff that I talked about at the beginning of um, the presentation was talking about like who's disposable. Um, so if you're relying on the same logic, technology is not going to address that. So for example, um, I remember just a few months ago there was this like massive like double pager in The Guardian that was talking about um, one solution would like the, there's like this immense um, amount of like land in the Sahara and we could just put like a billion or whatever um, solar panels in there and that would give us enough energy. And I just remember thinking do you not know that there is already conflict in the Sahara? Like that mentality that like um, extractivist mindset of like we, there's just land there for the taking we can just have it, put our stuff there, and we'll get good energy. And I think you can see that with, for example, like Iraq is like a huge um, exporter of um, oil, but the majority of people in Iraq don't have um, energy for most of the day, right? So the problem isn't necessarily technology. I'm not, I'm not saying oil is going to get us out of this, but just to tell you that like the technology is not necessarily the problem. I think the problem is the structures that decide who's worthy of of those technologies. I was like, I was just thinking of like Bill Gates' power plant that uses like depleted uranium, and like right now with U.S. trade wars with China, like he was supposed to go in to production of it with China, and like um, basically in order to create like plumbing and electrical that like didn't have any damage to anyone, it was really meant for emerging economies, developing countries. So like that's like the solar panel went on the yacht because they're too expensive and not really efficient. So that's like a bad yeah. article, but. I just yeah. need like an actual technology that's like thought through and like actually would very much help people, but like not a lot of people know about it. Yeah, but I, I mean, I think my argument still stands that actually you can have the best technology, but it's not going to be available to everyone, right? There's if if the structures, if the politics and ideological frameworks don't change, you can just have like you know we might all have like amazing green cars in Britain that won't make a change for like most people elsewhere, and there and because that is. Like you can just see it in terms of like energy consumption in the world, right? Who has access to energy and who doesn't? So right. that's why I love the focus on the global Green New Deal is really to talk about redistribution and fundamental shifts in in power structures, right? Just to be able to like reflect those inequalities that exist. Because if you don't address these inequalities, technologies m might even further those those inequalities, right? Because in many ways, there's been like huge advances in technology that have made my life a lot easier but haven't made like haven't had any effect on like a whole bunch of other people. So I think that's why the question of like technological fixes sometimes you at some point you're going to hit a dead end, right? So I think that's I think that's where some of that um framing comes from. Um the question about extinction um I think it's a really good question. I've, and for me there's two things. One one of the critique about the the framing of extinction is that it has led to quite a lot of people being um like feeling absolutely powerless and hopeless, including a lot of young people. So you have this weird polarization. We have like obviously loads of young people around the world taking action even more so than before. But there's also like a great deal of like fear and I don't know, if, I don't, maybe it's not fair to call it apathy, but just like a, a feeling of like total powerlessness. So I think there's a risk there. Um, I guess it's also the sort of like pro of that is to really slap people into action, kind of. Um, but I guess for me, one of the main thing that I think, to some extent, it's a problem of like something to do with like strategy and tactic. Like, okay, if it brings loads of people in, sure, maybe. But really, when you say when you talk about extinction as something that's about to happen, and a lot of the framing again, if you go to some of the rallies, and I've heard people say it, 
Um, it's about like what will happen to your children, right? And then a simple answer to that is like, well, some people's children have already died um, and had been dying for a really, really long time. So what does it mean to frame this as something that's about to happen in the future? And I think the point you made about the role of national government. So again, that's, that's the, 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 the fear that a lot of us are having about like the way in which the, a lot of the narratives of climate justice-ish are being co-opted um, by right-wing governments to justify tougher, like militarized borders, right? Um, and I think you're totally right that there, like one option for the future would be like really, really bordered um, states where, um, yeah, if it's, it's impossible for you to, to come in and it doesn't matter whose responsibility is for like, you know, chaos across the globe. And I don't think that that's a, that's not, um, it's not far-fetched. And I think it's quite easy when we're sitting here in London to think about like militarized borders as, ah, oh, that's never gonna happen. But it's been happening for decades, right? Like Frontex, which is the armed um, institution of the European Union, um, we have militarized borders in, in the Mediterranean, right? They've, it's been reported um, that Frontex have shot at boats trying to come in. It's not, it's not a conspiracy, it's not like, it's not even a secret, really. I think we know we know those stories. So if that's been happening for years, um, the moment that we we reach the sort of the limit um, here for us, because obviously the lim limit has been breached a long time ago elsewhere, that's when suddenly <coughs> the the ground will be really ripe for for even more militarized solutions. So I think that's why a lot of us right now are trying our hardest before it's too late to really break. Um, the sort of like hold of nationalism and a lot of the climate solutions that that we're seeing and I think that's really fundamental so if you take anything from tonight um, I would suggest maybe that that should be it is really thinking about how do we like make sure that we don't allow nationalism to come and tamper with with our vision for climate justice um, because I think the stakes are really high and it's not it's not impossible I know there's been loads of like dystopian like TV series and stuff that just seem really far fetched, and now like I remember everyone talking about like the Handmaiden, um, Handmaid's Tale, being like, ah, oh, this could actually happen. I think when you're thinking about dystopian climate futures, it's already happening. Um, so I think that was a really good, um, really good point. Okay, that's a question. Okay. Um, thank you for the excellent talk, first of all. Um, I'm just looking at this nice screenshot of a tweet. Uh, from uh, Black Lives Matter, and it says, uh, one of the black words says, don't be a COP, don't be a cop. Do you think, um, do you think Extinction Rebellion might be the cops? <laughs> Especially with this, uh, I think, what did they do? They sent flowers to Brixton police station recently, where someone pointed out like four people have been murdered inside the station. And I think it, they sent the flowers to Bristol police Bristol, station, right. but then, yeah, we did a lot of work to talk about Brixton. Um, <sighs> yeah. Um, do I think Central Valley is cops? I am not. No, I'm, I don't think so. Um, but I think you can be, you can you can cause damage in a movement without being a cop. Um, and I think that I don't know. It's tricky because some of some of the conflict is about strategy, right? So I guess the 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 notion of the whole like love bombing of the police. It's a it's a strategic choice. The idea is that we're going to break them and then they're going to stop and then they're going to stop um, trying to stop us from doing what we're trying to do and then that's when the tide turns. Rough. I mean, you can read about the strategies. They're really, really open about the, like, the, the tactical thinking that's gone behind it. Um, and then you can decide what you think. But I think with that specific incident of sending flowers to the police and saying thank you so much for being so professional, uh, of course it angered a lot of people. Um, because, as you said, a lot of people went into police stations and never came out. Um, so in Brixton Police Station, notably, um, Sean Rigg uh, was having, uh, um, he, was, um, he was schizophrenic, and he was having an episode, and he got taken into uh, a police van and dropped outside Brixton Station, and he, he didn't come out alive, right? So thinking about the very real... Um, actions of, of the police um, is, is really important. So I think that's why a lot of people have quite a big issue with that specific part of the tactic, which is um, to be so loving towards the police, especially because in many ways, I think 
the Black Lives Matter movement in the US but also in the UK has been really instrumental and fairly successful at really pushing the idea of like police violence and state violence um, and the fact that in the UK not a single police officer has ever ever faced justice for any of the deaths and I think there's been 1,000 uh, more than 1,600 um, people who've died in police custody but also in sec secure mental health units and in prisons um, since 1990 and there's been zero conviction right so in, in that regard it's worse I mean it's you know it's not really about comparing but in the US once in a while very rarely there'll be someone being brought to justice. Um, in the UK, there's been no, no convictions. So I think to now have one of the biggest, for some maybe the most exciting movement in town, um, really undoing all of that work of really pointing to the deep, deep issues in, um, not just in the police as an institution, but all of the institutions around the police that enable cops who, who have killed um, to still be um, in the force. So, for example, Jean-Charles de Menezes was um, shot um, in Stockwell Station, uh, and the commanding officer for that is um, Christina Dick, who is the current head of the Met Police. So you can be the person who says, yes, fire. Um, and then a few years, years later, you're promoted to the head of like the most powerful police force in, in the UK. So I think that's the context that many of us have in mind when we're unhappy about you know people sending flowers to the police and praising them in very public um, public ways um, and just chanting we love the police I think so actually part of the work we've been trying to do since that is using that as an opportunity to shed light on some of the um, activism that's happening right now around um, justice for people who've been killed by the police so on the 26th of October um, that will be the annual march um, organized by the United Families and Friends campaign, who are the families and the friends of people who've been killed in police or state custody. And so state custody also means Grenfell, um, because that was social housing, so that was state custody. Um, but also in uh, immigration detention centers. So on the 26th, that's their annual march. It's always on the last Saturday um, of October, um, and it starts at 12 in Trafalgar Square. Um, so we've invited um, people from Extinction Rebellion to join us um, for this um, silent annual march. Um, and yeah, we hope that some people show up because I think that has to be part of, of the story, um, especially because the third demand is to be beyond politics. So if be, being beyond politics can include sending flowers to the police station, um, surely it should also include showing up for for the friends and the families of people um, like Sean Rigg, like Sean Charles de Menezes, who have died literally at the hands of, of the police. That's one question. Hi, uh, I have a question about the way you see uh, climate activists navigating the media coverage and I guess the notoriety that some of them are given due to the activism because I guess obviously activism benefits from a little bit of coverage because more people are aware of issues get involved and then some change may occur. But then certain climate activists are given quite a bit more attention than others due to their privilege and as a result of it, for maybe a temporary moment, their narrative around what it is is the focal point of, of many conversations, which then is part of the reason you're or uh, other movements have met with so much hostility because they are puncturing this symbol that has been created and like personal heroes that people mm. make and it's just like who gets elevated, who doesn't, how do you navigate that, what do you think? Yeah. Um, should I? Do? Yeah, please, there's no other questions. Um, yeah, that's, that's an interesting question. Um, I think it's slightly tricky because it's not always clear where like where responsibility lies um, in the sense that for example like if you read um, some of the stuff from uh, Greta Thunberg she's actually really really well connected and the team of people around her who are supporting her like a lot of them are really good people and who are really solid and have like a lot of links with um, people, including in the Global South, um, other young activists in different, um, like different countries, including um, some like indigenous like youth leaders 
in North America. And so those connections, I think she definitely makes them really clearly. And in her speech, she talks about equity. And if you Google what that's pointing to, so that's, I was mentioning that in the talk as well, is the idea of like fair share, which is a really, it's a radical notion, right? It is talking about reparations. Reparations is not a sexy word. No one wants to talk about reparations. But that's actually the content of what she's talking about. So, so what I'm saying is that I don't actually have a problem with like the focus on her, but I think you're totally right to point to like all of the mechanisms around that mean that we're way more likely to hear that from her. Because obviously, like everything that she's done when she was, you know, on her own, really young in Sweden, that's you know, that's that's amazing and it's really great. Um, but of course, there's like people have been fighting for a really, really long time. Um, Berta Caceres was uh, murdered in 2015 after, I mean, she wasn't a young person, um, but she was uh, murdered for her climate activism. Ken Sarawiwa in uh, Nigeria was also murdered for trying to point at all the atrocities that were happening around the Niger Delta for oil. So people have been campaigning for a really long time uh, and putting their bodies literally on the line. Um, and so I think part of the work is to be able to like acknowledge that, but not just in a visual representation kind of way, but like deeply acknowledge that there is so much resistance that's happening elsewhere yeah. that we're totally unaware of um, and that we should actually be immensely grateful for um, because who knows how worse things would already be if it wasn't um, for all of that. I think there's a statistics um, about indigenous people being 5% of the population yet um, responsible for preserving 82% of the world's biodiversity, right? Like that's that's an incredible statistic, um, and I think that's the kind of stuff that gets erased when we um, focus on individual heroes. And I don't think that's a problem just in the climate movement. I think it's generally, right? I think um, it's like Black History Month right now, right? Yeah. Um, and what you have is very often like focus on individual heroes, which are like that's really important because sometimes that's how you remember stories is by remember like this one name and this one name. But what you miss out on is stories about movement building and how, how that works and connections within the movement and how like different like individuals sometimes can really create like large spaces because actually what we need to think about right now is beyond like the role of individuals and really thinking about the role of like collectives and movements and yeah including mass mobilization so i think it's a bit of a double-edged um sword but i guess the mechanism of erasure that it just it always happens so i guess it's about being aware of that and just whatever you hear just keep in mind that there's so much more and then it's on you to like look into what else um what else is going on and who else is is moving um in in those ways can I ask a question? Yeah. I'm just going to ask a final question because I don't see any others unless I'm missing somebody. You've already had your chance. Um, so it's, it's basically about at this point you finished on about building movements and I'm kind of struck that um, BLM UK and Russia of the Earth have been through like, a huge series of conflicts. And in a way it's kind of a, it's a, a Russia of the Earth is born out of the conflict in 2015. Um, I'm, I'm quite struck that like through your discourse and through all of this, you haven't really gone into like cancelling culture and sort of mm -hmm. like we're never going to talk to you again because you've kind of offended us in some way, or, which mm -hmm. is kind of really common now, especially through social media and Twitter and the rest of it. Um, so I'm just wondering if there's, an, I, in a way, I think because social media and that kind of, um, uh, for me, it's a sort of representation of virtue, it's, it's a kind of meritocratic representation of virtue in that everyone has to demonstrate that they're the most virtuous person possible on social media. But you always end up with these kind of like horrible conflicts and people kind of become much more atomized and entrenched in the views and, and what Russia of the Earth and the uh, movements that you've shown seem to go completely against that and continue in the coalitions and continue in the movements that nonetheless try and uh, limit and constrain the importance of the work that you're doing. I wonder if like, you could speak a bit about how to do, how to withstand the kind of like the obvious conflicts and kind of look past them, or kind of negotiate them, or try and engage with them productively for the goals of the movement. Yeah. 
Um, in some ways, I don't think I'm the best person <laughs> because I think sometimes it can be really difficult. Um, personally, I am really committed to movement building, um, but it's really hard work because, um, and especially when it's quite easy to like, like some of the narrative we're seeing now, um, including on social media, is the idea of like, you know, we have to agree to disagree. When the whole thing with like Ellen DeGeneres and um, Bush, and like the idea of like, you know, sometimes you can be friends with people and you have to agree to disagree. But actually what was happening there was like, a, that's a deep ideological mm -hmm. conflict, right? Like that's someone who is head of state and who is personally responsible for the death of millions. So it's, you don't just agree to disagree. You need to acknowledge that there is a deep conflict and actually your opinion is like rests on dehumanizing and like genocide yeah so you also at some point you do need to be able to like draw draw a line in terms of movement building um i think it's also quite easy at times to see which um like how to build alliances so for example the youth strikers have been really really phenomenal and very open um as, as they've been coming up in, in, in the UK and really they've been reaching out loads to try and like get um, like support and resources and try and figure out like how to not replicate um, the issues that are in like the wider um, climate movement. So there's, you can, one you can really see when people are like up for growth and learning. Um, so that's the first thing. And then it's, it's, it's tricky. I think with like big movements, it's about being able to see differences in institutions and differences in power. So there might be a difference with the way you're going to interact with someone um, from like a, a local group of like Extinction Rebellion who's just finding out about this stuff and it's just like, oh, that's really interesting, I want to know more. <coughs> and then some of the people who are the actual architects mm -hmm. of the movement, who are, who are the ones who are putting the, the, the message of um, we need to go against mass, what they call mass immigration. Um, so it's like actually can we work with you right now? Maybe not, uh, but maybe there's different ways of engaging. So it's about thinking strategically about points of intervention. And I think as activists and organizers, you you have to be looking for the points of intervention. And someone is about acknowledge, sometimes about acknowledging that's just not gonna work right now. Um, but it's also a deeply personal thing. Like if you, there's different people in like the rest of the earth or even in BLM, We've got different approaches. Some people are way more resilient to working in specific spaces. I'm, I think naturally I'm not a very, I, I'm fairly resilient, but I'm not very patient sometimes. Mm -hmm. So sometimes it's better for me to just stay back because it's not easy. So I also don't want to like romanticize resilience or romanticize going into spaces that can be really, like really violent and really brutal. Like loads of people haven't come back since the 2015 mm. march like i like i had a friend who like broke down and like was crying because of like the violence of that mm. moment right so it's also just being able to acknowledge some of the deep um places of tension um but i think yeah it's 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 good to think about it and to keep thinking about like how do we build like mass movements because at the end of the day that's the only way we're going to be able to move um Forward and to some extent, there are like a, like more and more people. I think have a, a deep commitment to to this sort of like movement building and to actually really thinking quite critically and radically about um, climate justice. And one of the things that, that I'm seeing that really excites me is people from across the movement. So people who work on things like housing, people who work um, on like prison abolition, are really like coming together and building those connections um, and I think that goes back to the question about like individuals and how that masks the fact that sometimes it is about having like different people whose names you'll never know who are actually building building those connections across across the movement um, in specific countries but also across countries and these like constant conversations that are happening um, I think that's the sort of like movement ecology that that really um, inspires me right now that's great. Okay. Um, so wait. Um, so don't forget the consented is on sale upstairs. Um, and thank you. That was a great talk. Thank you.